you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and take them out and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 18. We're starting a new chapter this morning. And uh, you know what? Before we uh, get into it, we probably should pray for uh, our friends in Houston right now. So let's, let's pray for them. Lord, we just want to intercede for our brothers and sisters in Houston and all those down there in that area that are just right now experiencing a, a catastrophe. Lord, we pray that uh, this would be something that would cause many to put their faith in you, Lord, and that you would provide the things that are needed for them physically, Lord, the, the rescue, the supplies. We pray for um, those uh, first responders that are there and those who are going down to help, Lord. We pray protection on them. And Lord, we just uh, open ourselves up to any way that we might be able to help them at all, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, far as announcements go, just go ahead and check out the bulletin. Um, we had our women's tea yesterday. I heard that was pretty fantastic. And um, we have women's things starting up um, for the fall semester. We have the men's thing just ending. So we're going to meet again on Saturday. I think that's our last one for uh, a little while. Take a little break after that. And um, lots of other things going on in and through the church, so just check out the bulletin for that. But I'm really excited to get into the Word this morning. We finally made it to chapter 18 of the book of Revelation, and we've been working our way through. And uh, boy, we're now getting to the point where the end of the world as we know it is going to be, yeah, some of you know that song. That's not amazing. Some of you, it triggered a song from how long ago? That's, that's really something, isn't it? The, the end of the world as we know it. So here's what I want us to be thinking about as we go through this. Because last week, we saw the end of religion as we know it in chapter 17. So we looked at that. We spent some time in, in chapter 17. And we looked at um, how... Religion is going to take on a worldly characteristic. We've seen and we see now these things happening in our world. Uh, worldly Christianity, uh, embracing of all truths and um, all these things that are trying to bring religion under one umbrella. These are pieces of the puzzle. This is the stage being set for a time where there will actually be a one world religion. But what's interesting is we saw that and looked at that over the past several weeks. We also saw that this religion, this one world religion, was carried by the Antichrist. So there is a woman riding the beast, chapter 17, that's what it's all about. There's a woman riding the beast, the woman being this city where the one world religion will uh, be headquartered, and we looked at that in detail. But it's interesting that this religion is riding something, but we see a development as we go through the book of Revelation. I want to show you that as a way of introduction. Look at chapter 17, and look at verse um, three. So chapter 17, verse three, it says, so he carried me away in the spirit. This is John being given this vision into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Okay. So that's that, that image. And we looked at that. So the, the woman is this, a uh, one world religion, and then the beast is the Antichrist, and we've looked at that in detail through the book of Revelation. But watch something happen here. Look at verse 7, chapter 17. It says, But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman 
and of the beast that carries her. So now we have a, just a, a little, slight little angle, a little something different that, that we see this chapter was focused on the woman, but we get a glimpse that it was really controlled by the Antichrist. So the Antichrist is carrying the woman before it is more she's riding the beast. And now we get this picture. Well, he's actually behind all this, the Antichrist. And so um, just to remind you, the Antichrist will be this ruler who will rise up from a succession of Roman kings, authority kings that we've seen in the past. And we talked about that. He will arise out of a 10-nation confederation in Europe. And in the beginning, he will come offering peace. He will come um, with an olive branch. There, there will be a pseudo world peace for a short amount of time. And one of the ways that he is going to help institute world peace is that he's going to enlist religion to help him. So well, if we can get, first of all, rid of true Bible-believing Christians, if we can get rid of them, the world would say, the Antichrist would say, if we can get rid of them, are, are, is that going to happen? Yes, in the rapture of the church. The way is paved, Bible-believing Christians gone, the headache of the world gone, the restrainer gone opening up the way the Antichrist comes into a chaotic scene, offering an olive branch, offering solutions, telling everybody, we can do this all together. We are the world. There'll be probably songs and things, people singing, kumbaya, everything's great. Finally, we've arrived, utopia, nirvana, whatever. And we're even going to have a one world religion. We're all going to be under this one heading, this one umbrella world unity. Well, that's going to go on until the three and a half year mark where the Antichrist, after he uses this one world religious system, he uses it for his gain and acceptance because ultimately he wants to be worshipped as God. That's his aim. So this is Satan's last ditch effort. But watch what happens at the end of chapter 17. So let's take a look at Verse 15. So it says, Then he said to me, The waters which you, which you saw were, the, uh, were where the harlot sits, that was the one world religion, and peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, and the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot. So here's another change. So now the Ten Nation Confederation that's headed up by the Antichrist, instead of the woman riding the beast and then the beast carrying the woman, now the woman, the religion, is hated by the beast. So the beast got what he wanted from the religion. He got what he wanted. So watch what happens. It says in verse 16, and the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot. Ten horns were the ten nation confederation. And they will make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. It's pretty intense. Now watch this. For God has put it into their hearts, these kings, these, the ten nation confederation, to fulfill his purpose. To be of one mind. That's the key. This one mind, one mindedness of the world. And the one mind is a, a mind, a world against God. And it says, and to give their kingdom to the beast. That's what he ultimately wanted. He didn't want to share it with religion. He used religion to get what he wants until the words of God for, are fulfilled. Look at verse 18. And the woman you, uh, whom you saw is a great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. In verse eight, uh, 1 of 18, so it says after these things. So now we have a, a statement of progression. So um, 
just to get us back into the mindset, we're in the tribulation, chapter 6 through 19. This is uh, the tribulation. So the church is in heaven, seven years on earth where God pours out his wrath, trying to bring back the nation of Israel to faith in him. And, and that happens. But what we also see is we see many people coming to faith in the tribulation and also many people revolting against God more and more and more until ultimately they're worshiping the Antichrist. So look at our text now as we work our way through. And the title of the message is The Characteristics and Judgment of the One World System. So he says in verse 1, he says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And the angel, he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. So what's going on here? So, okay, so here's what we're seeing here. This is the end of the world as we know it. Literally, this world system. So, so you, what do you mean? So what does this mean? Is it the end of the earth? Is it the end of the earth and the solar system and all that? What this is talking about is not the end of the earth yet. This is the end of the system, the world system that controls the earth, that controls humanity. So how did this happen? Well, God first gave dominion over the earth to who? Us. Your relatives. Not monkeys, okay? That's not, that's false stuff. So if you think you're a monkey, you're not. Adam and Eve. So, so God gave them the charge to subdue the earth or to rule over the earth. And then man subsequently was tempted in that regard and gave over dominion or control of the earth to Satan. And ever since then, that event is called the fall of man, fall of mankind. So the, the world and mankind have been tainted with sin. And the world as we know it, as we've become accustomed to, is not the world that God designed. It is the world marred by sin. So anyone who wants to look at the world in such a way where they would look to the world to find their hope, their happiness, their joy, their fulfillment, they will find that that is an empty way to live. Because you can't be fulfilled in a sin-fallen world. But see, God went about to redeem mankind, and also eventually the world. The world's not redeemed right now. If it were redeemed right now, we wouldn't have gray hair or losing our hair or, you know, sore backs and headaches. That's a sign of the fallen condition of the world. But God will redeem the world. But however, He has redeemed mankind. So that through Jesus that we can experience heaven on earth inside of us where he dwells where his kingdom is and that's as we allow him to govern our life so here's the thing we need to be thinking about so if you're a Christian you're you're in the world you live here but you have to ask yourself what's our relationship with the world. That's what's key. So how does this all play out? How am I supposed to, as a believer, live my life in the world? How am I, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to 
get a job and work and, you know, what's of God and what's not and how, what's all the practical implications of all that? That's an interesting question. We'll try to answer that as we go along here. But in order to answer that question, what we have to know first and for, foremost is that the world system is ruled by the Antichrist, or I'm sorry, Satan, ruled by Satan, and eventually the Antichrist will be the um, embodiment of Satan himself that will come into the world at the very end to try to get followers after himself. But we have to understand first that the world isn't, the world system isn't kind of okay and not that bad. The world system is run by the one who wants to steal your soul. And so that one who wants to steal your soul, who wants to damn you to hell forever, he usually doesn't come in as obvious ways than we might think. He usually comes as an angel of light. He usually comes in ways that appeal to some sense in us of our uh, desire for goodness with, without God, our desire for the world to be okay without God, the desire for us to be independent from God. So he, he puts these little kernels out like that. It's almost like he puts his tail out and makes his tail look real cute. So we will grab onto that tail. But you know what? You have to see what it's attached to. And that's uh, a lot of the subtleties of how he draws people in. And so we have uh, now, a, we call it secular or carnal. These are uh, things that are opposed to God or worldly. I like the word carnal because it reminds me of chili con carne, <laughs> which carnal means fleshly. So he gives us little tidbit, little things, you know, like that maybe for us it's intellect. And maybe we go to a philosophy class in a university and, you know, we're thinking, man, this, this person, they're really smart because they have a PhD and they're telling me stuff that's different than... I'm learning in church. Maybe they know a little bit more. Maybe they're super smart. And it appeals to our flesh. And we just grab, maybe you grab a little of that tail of intellect, or I would call it anti-intellect, because the Bible says by their wisdom they became fools. But remember, the university system in general is a run by anti-God people. That's no mistake about that. It's this uh, way to program people, just like we looked at before with the whole brain hacking thing that some of the Silicon Valley people have uh, talked about, and we looked at that. But see, here's, here's the thing. is that there, There's these little things that go out there. It could be if you're, say you're a real compassionate person, and now your compassion is misplaced. To where you're thinking, and maybe not consciously, but that you're actually more compassionate than God. You may not realize that, but all of a sudden it's this compassion thing. And maybe if you're a you know, real compassionate person, that's a good thing. But everything has to be balanced by the truth. So then now, now you put social justice ahead of truth. Ahead of the word of God. And then you can get fired up by that. It could be music. Say you really like music. You like the arts. That's a great thing. But when you start to listen to the philosophies of those through the music, and you say, well, it really doesn't matter their lyrics or what they say. I just like the vibe. The vibe's really cool. You know? Well... Satan uses cool vibes. He was the music director in heaven. 
And so how many of us have latched on to that tale of good music? And that tale leads us down a road of anti-God thinking. So we can go on and on with these things. It could be sports. It could be a fast, our, our country is fascinated with sports. Last night was a sporting contest of two people who, through the build-up to the fight, promoted themselves through vulgarity, sexuality, pride, and the most vile things that made people want to pay $100 to watch the fight. If you did that, I'm not judging you. That's between you and God. But the point is, that there's something wrong with that. There's something that, that's, that's diabolical about that. But see, what happens, we, a lot of times we don't just see it as that bad. Because we're just, we're, we're not hugging the devil, we're just grabbing his tail a little bit. And that doesn't seem as bad. <coughs> but that's a slippery slope. And see, what we're seeing here, and what we have to understand first and foremost, if we're going to have a proper relationship with the world as a believer, then we first have to understand what the world is. We have to understand what the world system is all about. And that then will start our thinking and start our correct understanding of how to properly relate to the world. You see, something happens when a person gets saved. One of those things that happens is our relationship with the world changes. Before we were of the world. Before we um, found our joy and our pleasure and our future and our hope and our dreams, we found it in the world. But once we got saved, we are no longer of the world. Once we got saved, our residence and citizenship changed. And so one of the difficult things for us as Christians, if you're a Christian, is learning how to navigate that. And learning how to, how to live your life out in the world as a believer. And then we have things compounded in our society or maybe in a suburban setting, in a, a fluent suburban setting, if that, I don't know where you live, but just in general terms, where then you have a lot of materialistic things that you have to choose from. So now you have all these decisions, what's okay and what's not okay. And I'm not here to tell you what's okay and what's not okay. I'm here to tell you to follow the Lord and seek God's guidance in these issues. I'm not here to put a trip on you, a legalistic trip. I'm, I'm here to help all of us understand what this world system is all about and where it ends. Where it ends. So watch what happens. In verse 2, he tells us that this place, and, and I believe this Babylon, what he's referring to, I believe, and, and there's some slight differences of opinions, but I believe what he's referring to, as we looked at last week, is, is little, the revived Rome, the actual city of Rome. We saw that in chapter 17. I, and I believe Rome is going to be the center of the one world religion and the center of the operation of the Antichrist. So that's what I think. Some people think that Babylon is actually going to be rebuilt again, which is in Iraq, but that's a whole nother thing. But I believe it's, it's Rome. So this place, now notice, I find it very interesting in verse 2 that, that when this Rome, and, and, and you may say, well, why is it called Babylon? Well, we looked at that, but this goes back into the whole Babylonian religion, Tower of Babel, Genesis 11 and Gen Genesis 10 and 11, and that being the origin of all pagan religions. We looked at that. You can get that all online. But, but now, so, so he, John's seen Babylon, the religion falling. Now he's seen Babylon, the economic and political part of this system, of this world system. And as he's, as he's seeing it, he's, he's literally seeing the city end in a moment's notice. And he's, he's seeing that, that what's behind this place, I find this fascinating, that 
he didn't seem to see this at first, but now he's seen that this place was filled with demonic and evil spirits. He says it's a dwelling place of demons, of foul spirit and unclean hated birds. These are all references to the demonic component of what is driving this whole thing. So a lot of times we just, uh, on the surface, like I said, we don't see the evil that's driving a lot of these things. And that's why we have to be very concerned about living and making choices biblically. And a, and a lot of times in, it, it's, it's a, a matter of filtering our choices through the truth. Because I've been around the block just a little bit, enough to see how little compromises end up engulfing people in terrible sins and ways of the world that take people captive in ways that they never thought they would end up going down that road. And maybe some of you have been down that road. Maybe some of you are on that road. But it's no joke when you see that. If you, you know people that have been just sort of taken by the world, almost like kidnapped. People just a little compromise here, a little compromise here. And next thing you know, they're, they're just taken over by the world. So this is, when you see that, it's, it's not a joke. And you realize from our scripture that what's behind it is these evil forces that have even a, a sort of power over the world, a delusion. And it's, it's interesting, I'm uh, discipling a few guys from the church, and you can ask them, but when they started getting on fire for the Lord and started to grow, and all of a sudden, all these people started coming into their path to like pick them off. The one guy, he was walking out of the gym and a random person came up to him and said, hey, come here, and started telling him things. He'd never seen this person before and started telling him things about him that the guy had no way of knowing. And the guy said, follow me. Let me disciple you. Let me mentor you. He didn't even know the guy. And the guy was saying all these things to him that there's no way he could have known. And then they're, they're being uh, confronted with people saying, hey, come to my church. Your church is okay, but my church, we have all these signs and wonders going on. It's a little more, you know, we're a little more advanced, a little more in tune to the Spirit. And I'm not opposed to signs and wonders, but the Bible says a wicked and a crooked and wicked generation seeks after signs and wonders. Satan uses signs and wonders. Did you know Satan can do signs and wonders? So we can't use that as a benchmark for the truth. But here's what we have to know. We have to know that the world system is driven by Satan and he uses his demons to pull people away from God into his clutches. The world system, that's what it is all about. Is it world system is an anti-God system. And if you are not sure about that, look what the world did to God himself. So look at verse 3. He says, for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. So now we see that the world system it uses enticement. So it refers, it says it makes drunk with, uh, with the wine of her fornication. So it appeals 
to the things of the flesh that people like. This is what we have to be so careful about. Because there, there are things that Satan knows about us that he will appeal to. And, and that's what happened with, with one of the gentlemen that had that encounter with that person outside of the gym. That person was tempting him with some of the things that that person was concerned about or, or thinking about or desiring. And that, that person said the same exact things almost like, like he knew what he was thinking, like he knew him, but he didn't. But here's the thing, and this is what's so subtle. Anytime we start to deviate from the Word of God, that's compromise. And we sort of live in a world where compromise is celebrated, right? Doesn't it seem better to compromise? You know, like if you're married, you're supposed to compromise, right? You're not supposed to compromise the Word of God. Because anytime you compromise the Word of God, you're actually giving up the purity of the Word of God. And so when you hear things like, you know, we have to sort of really pull back the reins on the Word of God because you have to be more relevant. But the Bible says we're to be salt and light, which is completely different and separate, not so much the same that people will like it and stay the same and never have a desire really for the true Christ. So this idea of, of compromise, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little deviation. So now we see these things in our society. We see the Word of God greatly compromised. And that could be in sound, sound doctrine or it can be indifference and then when you have churches that don't call people to live according to the Word of God and the Word of God is minimal then what you do is you're opening up the door for all sorts of ideas and philosophies of men when were to teach and preach the pure word of, of God. So now when you start to have an acceptance, a, 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 I'd say, say a national acceptance of a, an approach to Christianity that's not biblical in most cases, and you have the multitudes flocking in general to the churches that don't teach the Word of God and people aren't getting grounded in the Word of God, then the pastor could say whatever he wants and people will say, okay, as long as he's charismatic and funny and tells a lot of good stories and he's, he's short, like keeps it like 25 minutes, then you're good. <laughs> but when, see, here's the thing. When the masses of, of Christians think that that's normal. So it's like the, the new standard of Christianity is an unbiblical Christianity where it's the, the idea of denying self and taking up your cross and following Him is not really taught or emphasized, but yet what is emphasized is you can add Jesus into the stuff you're already doing and it'll be great. But remember, Jesus had a lot of people leave when he started teaching the truth about what it means to be a follower of Christ. And so we have this statement of Jesus that is, is really the, the crux of living as a Christian in this world but in general is completely overlooked and not taught. In fact, the opposite in general is usually taught 
And it's Jesus saying, not my will, but your will be done. That is the essence of being a follower of Christ. Not my will, but your will be done. But when you have a Christianity that's a Christianity without a cross, that's centered on the individual more than it is on Christ. And that people are just not going to come unless you fill their need and desire for entertainment and to have a good time at church. Now we have a problem. And I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. That's not my intention. But the intention is to understand, one, the church is very sick in our country. And we need to pray for the church. And we need to pray for ourselves. Because we're getting tempted and attacked daily. I'm sure you guys are individually. But then corporately as a church, it's constant. Because it's not a joke. And so we need to pray and we need to be rooted and grounded in the truth. Amen. That our roots will go deep down into God. Because God has a much higher calling for you and I than just not compromising. He has a higher calling that our, our light would shine before men that they would see our good works and glorify the Father in heaven. Amen. It's not just our safety and protection. Like, I don't want to compromise. I don't want to go down that road. But it's more than that. It's more than that. Because as we've been going through the book of Revelation, we've been seeing that the, the pieces of the puzzle are in place. The stage is set. And Jesus is coming back soon. Amen. And what are we doing with that? How does that move us and affect us and, 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 and shake us? And Jesus warned over and over again to watch and pray and to be ready. And you and I are faced with so many temptations to just fit our relationship with God in what's convenient or workable for us. And I think it was David who said, I'm not going to offer that to God which doesn't require a sacrifice. There may be a sacrifice. You may have to cut ties with some things. Your, your lifestyle might have to completely change. You know, sometimes our, our lifestyles, we get in such a routine that we don't realize that maybe this, these lifestyle, the lifestyle that we're in is not biblical or honoring of God or fulfilling the purpose and why God put me here. So the question is then, and I'm just going to end right here. The question is, are we willing to truly surrender ourselves to God? No matter what that may look like or how that may cost us or what we may have to give up or how things may have to change that will we be willing to, to just say Lord here I am completely and fully surrendered to your will and whatever you want to do with me you do that Lord because Time is very short. And maybe Jesus doesn't come back for 200 years, but we'll all be gone by then. Our time is all very short. And in the meanwhile, you see so much confusion, so much hopelessness, so much despair. And God has called us for such a time as this to be lights in this world offering the hope of Jesus Christ. And so, be grounded in the truth and be prayerful about your interactions 
and make your life about the Great Commission. Amen. Make your life about that. If you're a believer, that is your purpose. And not aligning to that purpose is to be out of sync with the reason why you exist on earth. Go into all the world making disciples and get this teaching them how to follow the Lord. That's our calling and the greatest calling that a human being can have on earth and especially in light of what we see. Amen. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning and thank you, Lord, that your word is an anchor to our soul. It's a light into our path. And thank you, Lord, that, that we can be grounded in your truth and we don't have to go down the slippery slope of the world, but we can truly know where things are headed and live our life accordingly, Lord. Lord, I want to pray for anybody here this morning that if they were to die today, they would not be sure where they would end up. I pray for anybody here, Lord, who would say that they want to be forgiven, that they want to go to heaven. Anybody who, say, who would say that they want to have a relationship with you, Lord. I want to pray for them right now. If that's you... The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that the penalty or wages of sin is death or eternal separation from God. But that God demonstrated His love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now whoever believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and rose again from the dead that they would be saved and so if you're here this morning I want to give you that opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to be what the Bible says born again a new creation in Christ to be a child of God a citizen of heaven I'm gonna lead you in a prayer this morning and this prayer is you asking God to forgive you of your sins. It's you recognizing that you're a sinner in need of salvation. As you pray this, pray it to God and realize it's not a, some magic formula. It's you asking God to forgive you of your sin and it's you putting your faith in Him. And as you do that, in that moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be forgiven of all your sins and you will be given your mansion in heaven for all of eternity. If that's you, pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe you rose again from the dead. And now, Lord, I'm turning from my ways. I'm turning to you, Lord. I'm asking you to come into my life, come into my heart. Forgive me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me, Lord, to walk with you all the days of my life. And I also just want to pray for all of you here. Maybe you are a Christian and you've gotten apathetic or complacent, you left your first love. Maybe you've got entangled in the cares and concerns of this world. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray that today that you would cut the cord to all those attachments 
that are keeping you away from God. All those things in your life that are eclipsing, no pun intended, your relationship with God. Anybody here that would say, you know, I, want, I just want to give my, my life to, to God fully. Just surrender it and let Him do with whatever He wants with it. So if that's you this morning, I want to pray for you. And just acknowledge now in your heart that that's what you want. Acknowledge in your heart that you just want to surrender your whole life to the Lord. But Lord, I pray for those here that would say, I just want to live my life for you, Lord. I pray for those who are now making a, a commitment, Lord, just to say, here I am, send me. I'm praying for those here this, this morning that would, would say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And those who would just lay it all down before your throne, Lord. I pray, Lord, now as, a, as we pray for them, that you would, you would bless them, Lord. You would empower them by your Holy Spirit. You would light a fire in their heart, Lord. That there would be the practical implications. That, that there would be those things, Lord, that they would, they would do and things that they wouldn't do. I pray that you would give them opportunities, Lord, to share the faith, the hope that lies within them. And I pray, Lord, that you would help them to to see things correctly, see the world correctly like you see it and help them to spend their lives like you spend, spent your life, Lord. I pray that you would empower them by your Holy Spirit, that, that they'd have a, a different relationship with your Holy Spirit even, that your Holy Spirit would overflow them, Lord. Empower them. That they'd be stirred to love and good works, Lord. I thank you, God. You honor our requests. I know that we're praying in your will and in your name.